Welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Coleman. And I'm Louise Palanker. You know, here on Media Path, we suggest a few good views or reads or streams. We call new content to your attention. If you like what we find, we send you somewhere else to find something similar to hold your interest. Today is going to be awesome because we're going to talk to two guys who are responsible for some of the most successful television broadcast or otherwise, Vince Manzi and Preston Beckman. They've launched highly successful network shows, blocks of shows. They've marketed them on to great success like Friends and Seinfeld and American Idol on Fox, the whole Thursday night lineup on NBC. And these shows really were just part of their amazing careers. Vince will admit that his gateway to success, the work that opened the doors for him, was the Fritz said it would be like this ad campaign on Channel 4 in Los Angeles. A phrase that even today, as I'm old and looking semi-homeless, some elderly woman <laughs> will yell at me across the produce aisle advance, Fritz said it would be like this. These guys have great stories about the inner workings of network programming. We're going to have a lot of fun. But Weezy, what suggestions do you have for us today? All right, so I'm going to start with a book that I read called Before We Were Yours, and it's by Lisa Wingate. The story rocks back and forth from a girl named Rill on a Mississippi riverboat in 1939 to a young lawyer named Avery, a present-day daughter of privilege, investigating a mysterious family secret. She uncovers the truth about her grandmother's entanglement with the notorious Tennessee Children's Home Society orphanage and its decades-long history of horrors against children. The story is fiction. The orphanage was real. They ripped poor children from homes and newborns from mothers, selling off the pretty ones to wealthy parents and disappearing the less desirable kids. I found the book to be riveting, and it was Publishers Weekly's number three longest-running <laughs> bestseller in 2017. Great book. Awesome. Well, I'm going to start with Hemingway, the Ken Burns and Lynn Novick documentary on PBS. It's a three-parter, six-hour PBS. It concluded last week, but if you missed it, it's streaming right now on Prime. You already know the reasons to watch this thing. It, it is the latest from the world's premier documentarian about America's premier writer. Hemingway changed America's writing style and changed how Americans see themselves. Many say he was the greatest writer since Mark Twain. He's written several of the great American novels, The Sun Also Rises, For Whom the Bell Tolls, A Farewell to Arms. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature. But Weezy, this is a really sad story, particularly the third act. The specter of suicide followed Hemingway all of his life because his father had committed suicide. And as much as Hemingway refused to admit it, it was almost like fate dictated that that's how he would end his own life. This is a giant cautionary tale about the hideous nature of depression and its genetic qualities. They had seven suicides in the Hemingway family. Most recently, his granddaughter, Margot, who was a successful model, died of a drug overdose in 1996. Many people thought it was because she was suffering from depression. So for Ernest Hemingway, the bad combination of depression and his own narcissism made him a desperate figure in his later years. But he was the great American writer, a story beautifully told by Ken Burns and Lynn Novick, and narrated by Peter Coyote, an amazing voiceover guy. I love the parts uh, where all the American expats like Hemingway and Gertrude Stein went to the cafes in Paris. Very romantic. And you have Jeff Daniels as the voice of Hemingway, which is always... That's pleasure. always the key. Whoever they yeah. get to do the voice of the guy. Mm -hmm. And Jeff Daniels was excellent. Yeah, it's really good. What else you got? Um, I have a documentary on Amazon Prime called It All Begins With a Song. This is a film that documents the struggles, inspirations, and creative journeys of Nashville's top songwriters. We also get to see how a song can transform a life and pull folks who hear their story in a song closer together. The film is packed with talent and insight featuring Garth Brooks, Brad Paisley, Luke Bryan, Rodney Crowell, Casey Musgraves, Ben Folds, and a whole bunch more. It's really fun if you love music and songwriting. I, I saw that and I and I loved it. And, you know, 
Nashville has turned into the vortex of all songwriting, not even just country, but all songwriting in general, mm -hmm. and some brilliant work coming out of there. Yeah. Well, my second share is another doc called The Fight of Our Lives. It's streaming on Prime, and, and this is a movie about how dangerous political correctness is. And I want to watch something about this topic because Jerry Seinfeld, which we're going to talk about today, coincidentally had said in recent years that he hates performing on college campuses anymore because political correctness is out of control. And coming from Seinfeld, who's about as offensive as toaster waffles, that's an indictment. <laughs> but since he said that, I've heard other performers say the same thing. In recent years, there have been news stories about people of various political views who are denied the right to speak on college campuses because a group of people happen to disagree with their theories. Ann Coulter at Berkeley. Now, I have a deep existential disdain for Ann Coulter, but this is all part of the cancel culture. This movie talks about how dangerous cancel culture is in more important ways, like what courses are taught at colleges, what professors can teach, who gets hired to be a professor at a college? And it's always follow the money. At a large university in the Bay Area that is not Berkeley, they've been getting sizable donations to the university from Mideastern countries like Saudi Arabia. Well, there have been professors that have taught with a hint of pro-Israeli stance, and they get shut down. Sometimes the course is canceled, donations are withheld. That's not the democracy the colleges are supposed to promote. That's not free thought. The movie follows the track of how that phenomenon severely slants what college students learn and how it affects their politics and worldview. It gets a little esoteric. You got pontificating college professors, but it's a great thing about cancel culture, which is a big topic of conversation right now. It's streaming on Prime. Yeah, I think it's an especially interesting topic because there's these there's these like the momentum shifts of social media that sort of tell you what your opinion is supposed to be if you're if you consider yourself to be awake. So you may hear about a story and have a certain opinion and then go online and then Twitter will tell you no, you're not allowed to have that opinion, you're not the right color, and it seems like we're very quick to cancel and a lot of these moments could be far more educational if if a mistake were made and instead of canceling somebody, you know, we said, all right, what could we all learn from this? What would this person have done differently if they had known differently? And I think we're missing a lot of really good educational opportunities by being too concerned with what our opinion is supposed to be, uh, lest we get canceled and including especially the big brands. Yeah. So it's and tricky. it goes against the main tenet of colleges, which is you go and you experiment and you get a little taste of all philosophies, all religions, all political persuasions, mm -hmm. and they're doing away with that. <clears throat> well. All right. I have a less controversial pick before you go to your uh, okay. esteemed guest, and it's Poldark. Are you familiar with Poldark? I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with it, but I haven't seen it yet. Okay. So almost 40 years ago, Ross Poldark galloped across the TV screens of millions of PBS viewers vexing villains and stealing hearts in one of Masterpiece's earliest hit series, Poldark. And now our gallant hero is astride horse again and five seasons deep into his new ride. Aidan Turner from The Hobbit stars as Ross Poldark, a redcoat who returns to Cornwall after the Revolutionary War to discover that his father is dead, his land is in ruin, and his true love is engaged to marry another. It is a bad day. Can Poldark change his destiny, restore his lost fortune, and reclaim his love? The series is based on the Poldark books by Winston Graham. There is so much to love in Poldark. Pretty people, period costumes, intricately interwoven character and story arcs, gorgeous cinematography, and this show is especially for you if you, like me, are into men on bluffs on horseback. The show is loaded with bluff porn, so pace yourself. You sold me. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet, but I, you know, all Brit all the time. Yeah. Best TV, best movies, best acting, best theater, whatever. It's great. All right, here we go. Vince Manzi, my good friend for many years, recognized as one of the most creative pioneers in entertainment marketing. Best known for his 20 years as co-president and creative director at NBC Universal, where he oversaw the iconic campaigns like Must See TV Thursday. He created award-winning campaigns for the Olympics and The Apprentice, 
for which he apologizes. <laughs> no, it was a he doesn't job. apologize for one of the most highly successful local news pro, uh, promotions. Fritz said it would be like this, f for which he borrowed my name. And the Fritz and Fred campaigns, Fred Rogan being the sports guy, he put Fred and I on the map. I'm telling you, the man extended our careers by 20 years and made us two of the most powerful people in broadcasting. <laughs> His most recent uh, project, and I can't wait to hear about it, is he oversaw the launch of Discovery Plus channels. And uh, and they did that on January 4th. And his partner, who I'll introduce now, was part of that project as well. Preston Beckman, widely recognized as one of broadcasting's premier strategists. Vince says he's probably the smartest guy in all of television. He served as uh, executive vice president, strategic planning and research at Fox for 12 years, where he oversaw the scheduling and launch of many shows. He was a key member of the team that shaped Fox with shows like American Idol, 24, House, Empire, and MasterChef. And before that, he worked with Vince at NBC on Must See TV and many other projects. Preston and Vince collaborated on Discovery Plus, and we're really happy to have him today. I don't know if an hour is enough time to talk to these guys. Vince. Hey, Fritz, how are you, bud? I'm good to see you. My, pleasure my, to see you. My friend. Even though no Let, Let's talk us. about your, your wildly successful local news promotion career. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is really, but that that's where you cut your teeth and you drew the network people's attention to your talent. Talk about how that all started. Fritz said it would be like so the Fritz and Fred campaign. It was a long time ago. We've known each other right, uh, 30, uh, 30 <laughs> times years. Although we're very young. We started when we were 10. The uh, it, it was uh, sometimes you you have to be creative. Sometimes you have to be lucky and the timing. Uh the Fritz campaign, if you recall, we just had white type over blue background, no logo, no nothing. It just said, Fritz said it would be like this. Now, a couple of years earlier, Fritz Mondale had lost the presidency. So everyone assumed it was Fritz Mondale making a political statement and whatever. And I just said, sure, spell my name right. And Fritz, it's Fritz. Uh, so that that kind of took off that way. And then um, we did some really wild promos that I don't know what we were either smoking or drinking back then. But if you recall, they were just weird. Uh, and Yeah, but they uh, were fantastic. But those were the days. And our boss, John Rohrbeck, who was a mentor to both of us, the, no, the, the, the people that ran the stations had the ability to make their own decisions about that stuff. There wasn't a big corporate superstructure telling you what you couldn't do. And so you came up with these amazingly creative ideas. And a story about the Fritz and the Fritz said it would be like this campaign. There was a conservative newspaper in Orange County that wrote this long, like a thousand word uh, editorial about finally the, the, the network news people show their true liberal colors. <laughs> finally, they had the guts to do it. <clears throat> And Fritz said it would be just a blatant uh, uh, um, support of Fritz Mondale. So when we read this, um, I, I signed a picture and sent it down to him. And I said, <laughs> Th thank you for the publicity. It was. Uh, and then um, we had Fred. Fred's campaign was Fred will show it to you. If it kicks, balls, whatever it does, mm -hmm. Fred will show it to you. And you two guys started to take off. And one of the things about marketing uh, that I, I pride myself on. If I don't come up with it, I recognize that this is good. So at that point, you could see this was happening. By the way, same thing with Must See TV. You could see what was happening. And so we did the Fritz and Fred promos, um, great sports through all kinds of weather. And we we started out uh, with the the basketball spot, if you remember, where at the end you hit him with lightning. But I will, I will. These are all on YouTube. If, if we've piqued your interest, they're all on YouTube. It's so they, plausible. Uh, I'll, so I, I, I'll get to Preston here at, at some point. But the, the big story is I almost killed, I have to say this, I almost killed you, if you remember. Um, I remember very well. It was very Yeah, I'm sure you do. We were outside shooting. I had a 50K way up, and it fell. And it came, he, we literally, it hit his hand and we had to had to go to the hospital for stitches and and to this day 
I that's that that light coming down. I still wake up with a sweat oh. because I have to call the general manager and say, "Hey, the shoot went well, but I killed your weather guy." <laughs> so <laughs> just wasn't. It just this was a nightmare, but we got through that. It was uh, it was it was pretty amazing. Yeah, and the irony of those commercials, and we'll stop talking about me for just a minute. But uh, the irony of those commercials was, you know, Fred was supposed to be good at sports because he's a sports guy, and I'm this geeky, thin weatherman. But I always beat him in all the so sports went, enterprises, that's... which made it funny. Well, I have a question about that, Vince, in terms of the strategy. Did you recognize or was it widely recognized that you couldn't have fun with your anchor because he was going to have to come on tomorrow and talk about some horrific, horrific event in Bosnia? And it, and but you could have fun and be and be zany with the weather guy and the sports guy. Totally. That's exactly 100 percent correct. And these guys were kind of doing it on the air anyway. I mean, they were, you know, they were loose. Uh, they sit, they fit in together. They fit together. And yeah, you can't, you can't do it with it with your anchor people. Uh, but you, we recognize that we could do that. The, the, the downside argument was, well, they're not the main people. They're the weather and, and, and the sports, which are lesser, especially, you know, I mean, Fritz has done the same weather cast for the what, 50 years now. So, <laughs> so, you know, it was a little less, it was a little less important, but for some reason, it, uh, people took to it and it, uh, it became, it, you know, again, truth in advertising. They were already doing this. I think that's the key to advertising is yeah, we were having the, fun on TV, by the full people and it never works. Plus it was so, different. People talked about it because it was different. Channel seven talked about it with great envy because it was different. And now difference is completely legislated I know, out of I know, television. I know. Preston, yes. must see TV Thursdays. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most successful network marketing concepts ever. And must see years at NBC are probably the greatest in their history. Talk about Thursdays. Why was it Thursday? How did you build? Did you build off one show as a tent pole out? What was the concept there? Well, uh, Thursday night in historically, and I don't know what what's true anymore in television, but but back then, Thursday night was the number one night for advertisers. It was the most important night for two reasons. One was the launch of theatricals, which generally took place on Friday. And second, people would go and shop for cars. So automotives wanted to be on television on Thursday night. So the, the value of an ad on Thursday was generally larger than any other night of the week. What we were doing with Musty TV was not only were we giving people big audiences, but we were giving people quality audiences. They were young, they were urban, they were upscale. It was everything that an advertiser wanted. Um, as far as, you know, as, as Vince said, you know, so much, so much of what we do is luck. Uh, when I what, came, what was the first show? What was yeah? I, I was just about to get. Well, I guess the first show was Cheers. Uh, there was Cosby. You know, there was Cosby and and Different World. Uh, some extent Night Court, but I I think that Cheers was the first non-family comedy show that we put on the night. Uh, so we had Cheers. Then we developed, uh, when I got there, we developed Mad About You. And Mad About You is an interesting show because I don't think it was ever given the credit it deserved. In fact, we had to move, I had to move it over to Saturday night for a while because we didn't know what to do with it. And the ratings were so impressive on Saturday night that uh, the following year, we moved it to the leadoff slot on Thursday. Then we had Seinfeld. And, you know, Seinfeld, I think it was 1989 is when we saw the Seinfeld pilot. And, um, you know, it took a while for it to find itself onto the schedule. Forget about Thursday night. It was on Wednesday night for about a year and a half. Um, and we and then the 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 other show was was Night Court. Uh, those were like, the I say, the original four. 
And then when when um, Cheers finished, we we added Frasier to the mix. So it was always some combination of those four shows. Now, and Vince, I think remembers this also. How must see TV started, or the or the name must see TV. Every afternoon, we would meet in Don Olmeyer, who was president of the West Coast Entertainment. We would meet in his office, uh, about eight or nine of us, and we would literally share everything we were doing, talk about the business, have some fun. Some days, not so much fun. And um, one day, uh, we were looking at the ratings. We were marveling at the ratings that we were getting on Thursday night. And... I'll take credit for, I won't take credit for Must See TV, the name, but I did say, because at that point, ABC on Friday night has something called TGIF. Thank goodness it's Friday, which was a block of family comedies, mostly Miller Boyette produced. And I remember at the meeting saying, you know, why don't, why, if ABC can label Friday night, thank goodness it's Friday. Why don't we come up with a, a, a label for Thursday night? It was so impressive what we were doing, not only with the four comedies, but even the 10 o'clock shows were, were impressive. And Don tasked Vince to go back to, and I'll let him finish, his people and come up with a, a term, with a, with a hook. But can I ask for a moment, could you set the table? Because if we have younger listeners to this show, they may not recognize how important each decision was in terms of scheduling, in terms of lineup, in terms of night of the week, because television viewers were limited to four channels. Most of them didn't even know how to use their DVR other than to play something they rented. So everyone was watching the same content and you were kind of a gladiator in this field where you were squared off against the guys that were scheduling and programming at the other three networks. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, um, you know, I, I never looked at what I did as a zero sum game, which was if I, my ratings were big, it was at the expense of the other guys. I always um, spent my time focusing on us, whether it was at NBC or at Fox. Um, and again, a lot of it's luck. It really, it really is luck. Uh, I think in the case of Seinfeld, um, we really didn't know what we had. I mean, there were a lot of people, even Within, within the network, I remember when I moved the show, to, finally moved the show to Thursday, there were people in sales who literally said to me, you've killed the show. Why did I kill the show? Well, it's never going to be as big as you think it's going to be. And I'm, I'm honest, I don't even know how big it was going to be. But we believed in it. And we felt that it, it earned a spot on a night where we were presenting all of these high-end sort of smart comedies. And um, that was luck. Man About You was almost canceled. <laughs> you know, I mean, we had to, at that point, we were building up the number of datelines on our schedule, which was the newsman. We wound up with about six at some point. And I was told, wasn't my choice, I was told you need to put a dateline on Wednesday night at nine o'clock. And that's where Man About You was. So I had to find a place for it. And I moved it over to Saturday in the race. We were, uh, I don't know if the, how well this is known. We almost still married with children from Fox. Wow. Uh, and we were, uh, we were negotiating, bringing it over to Fox. And we were going to put it on Thursday at 8 o'clock. And that same year, we had developed a show called Monty with Henry Winkler. I don't know if Vince remembers that one. Ironically, it was about a conservative talk show host and his family. And that was the show some people were hoping would be our Thursday eight o'clock show. It turned out to be a pretty horrible show. Ironically, Fox actually picked it up. Rupert Murdoch liked it so much that he picked it up <laughs> and it, it failed over at Fox. And then that, the married with children thing fell apart and we needed an eight o'clock show. And um, at that point, eight to nine was still considered something of a family hour. You, that's where you saw the family comedies. And I remember I was in the, in the scheduling room by myself. And I said, what am I going to do? And I looked at Mad About You and I put it at eight o'clock and I called up um, our head of research, Eric Cardinal, who's a good friend. And we sat there, and we stared at it. 
And, and we, we, knew, we knew what we were doing. We knew that it was not going to be a, a um, comfortable decision to make, that there were going to be repercussions. But we were willing to do it. And we brought everybody in. We brought Don in, probably Vince uh, came into the room. And we, we, we said, OK, here's our Thursday night lineup. And everybody kind of went, well, OK, let's do it. Hey, so, Vince, talk about uh, the idea of Seinfeld being an acquired taste. At first, all the network execs, I hope I have the story right, were judging it as being too Jewish, too urban, about nothing. All, all of those. And, and they, it, it, it took some convincing, right? So it was really a great success story in the end and sweet victory for Jerry and Larry. It, it, it was, it, for me, that, if you were to ask me what was the show, it was Seinfeld. That, that was, uh, you know, Preston filled in all the other blanks, but you got to have that one show that kind of carries it before and after. And that was Seinfeld. And as he said, we, we had no idea, although internally we loved it. We were not letting it go. We were all going to leave if they let it go. It was on against home improvement at its peak. No kidding. Wow. Who's, who's going to, you know, it, and then in those days, as Preston was alluding to, sales had such a big influence if they didn't like something they didn't think they could sell it you know instead of hey this is really good go sell it it was uh hey no don't don't do it once we put that move that over to thursday it just it just took off i think the original must see tv was uh was it uh a wings was it uh, it was uh wings. Was it about you wings signed so and, and Frazier you had for one year yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah. And then I think it was the last year for L.A. Law. But, Louise, as you were saying, it was all, it was literally, in those days, it was physical. People got home. Hey, you want to have a meeting Thursday night? No, I can't. Can't Thursday night. No, because I got to watch. And it wasn't just the taping, although that was a huge part of it. People wanted, they didn't want to miss it. They didn't want, it was water cooler television. And it was appointment television. It was, yeah. and so so people showed up. Uh, as far as the the, how did we come up with Musty TV? I think that story. Uh, we, so Don and Preston, they're they're pushing us, to, and I I wasn't a big label guy. I I didn't really you know at, at that point, but uh, I, I agreed, and so we had a creative meeting, and uh, we couldn't come up with anything, and it was lunchtime. We were getting hungry. And somebody in the back of the room said, how about my CTV? Oh, okay. That rhymes. That's good. And we all went to lunch. <laughs> and uh, and uh, because it's not the name, it's what you do with it. And, and uh, we then we embraced it and it was part of everything we did, including a couple of things to talk about. Preston again alluded to uh, the fact that, we went with adult shows at eight o'clock. Never had been done. That was a whole mashug. What is it? What do they call it? Mashugana. A uh, mashugana. <laughs> mashugana. Yeah, it was a whole big thing. And then we uh, we produced the network. We were the ones that did the uh, squeezing of the credits and um, and did all of that. To you know, some people liked it, some people didn't. But that was a uh, another whole thing that. Anybody these days, would you ever think they would know? Oh, yeah, we ran the whole credits. They would never know that. No, we would care. So, well, so the, the, every network tried to, and they did it demographically, but they also did it with content, wanted to have an identity. Well, NBC had an identity with their comedies, right? So you're saying you were going to bring over Married with Children, which doesn't seem to be one that sort of fits in with a smarter uh, above blue collar, um, um, you know, entertainment. But well, I mean, were, were there show? Did you guys sit down and say that's just not an NBC show? No, not at no, that point. I no, no. I mean, not we, at that point. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I, I, again, I, I think I, I wish we were smart enough to point to every decision we made and said we thought this thing through. You know, we knew exactly what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So much, I feel, of television is luck and random 
and just happened to make the right decision. And um, so I never, I never took a lot of credit. I never took, was full of myself. Even the move when we decided to bust up Thursday night and move Frazier and Wings to Tuesday night and start a second night of Must See TV, I did it not because I felt it was the smartest thing to do, but I was literally uh, threatened with death by some of our sales people in New York if I came to New York for the upfronts with a schedule that had reality television on Tuesday night, which is where we were at one point. And I just said what I remember is a Friday night in the middle of the night. Suddenly it came to me, let's split up Thursday. Let's move Fraser and Wings over to Tuesday. Um, we had we had a show called Friends about to come on. And again, luck. <laughs> you know, we didn't know what we had. And NER was coming on that year. Again, we had no idea. Uh, so we made the move. And, you know, it was a little scary. And there were people, I remember, um, uh, I, used to, I, I knew that the way I could get done what needed to be done was to be the last person to see Don Olmeyer before he left every day. Uh, you know? The Joe Biden <laughs> of the room. <laughs> well, you know, and, and what I, you know, we were having this debate and, you know, it was scary. It was a scary thing to do. We, we had built in one year, we had built this night. And now you, you're telling that you're telling me to dismantle it in one year. I'm like, yeah, you know, why not? Well, you know, <laughs> about wings. Wasn't, yeah. I don't, I don't know that this is true. I'm guessing that uh, wings required support like Mad About You did, right? Not a hugely, uh, successful show ratings wise am i right about that it just required support from the network to grow it well you know back then as was alluded to before you know if you were going to watch television you generally watched it live and so that back then lead-ins mattered and uh we had shows at 8 30 and 9 30 on both thursday comedies thursday and tuesday night that left to their own would probably not have been hits. But when you, when you sam sandwich or hammock these shows between two hits, they're suddenly top 10 shows. And um, the frustration that I had in, as a scheduler was we, we, were, we were getting a lot of our content back then from Warner Brothers and Paramount. And in order to, so we didn't own a, a lot of the shows. It's a very different business now. In order to hold on to those shows, we oftentimes had to make deals with Warner Brothers and Paramount to put new shows of theirs in the 8.30 and 9.30 time slots. Some of them were okay. Some of them were not. But in order to hold on to a Cheers, we had to, this is actually a true story. Uh, in order to renew Cheers for, its, I think it's final season or final two seasons, we had to uh, make a deal to pick up wings as well. Okay. Okay. When I uh, showed up in 1991 to do the scheduling, I wanted to move Seinfeld at that point to Thursday night. I felt it should be on Thursday night. I did it. I remember I put it up on the scheduling board and it was immediately taken down. And I turned to John Agolia, who was our head of business affairs after the meeting. And I said, you know, is, is there something I don't know? Is there something going on where we're keeping wings in a time slot where we could probably launch a new show? And he went, yeah, we have to keep it on Thursday for all of the 91, 92 season and the first 13 originals oh, of man. 92, 93. Okay. I brought a desk with me from New York, a wooden desk. I took a knife and in the 92, 93 season, Every time we air an original Wings on Thursday night, I put a gash in the desk. Wow. And, so I, and I would count how many. And then as soon as we got to the 13th, that's when we moved Seinfeld to Thursday night. Wow. wow. The Can desk you talk a little bit? The What's desk that? later sued him for, uh, for abuse. Yeah. <laughs> I, I literally would walk in on Friday morning and slam a knife into the desk. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure that was very cathartic. I want to talk about a, a lot of the brave choices that you made. For example, Will and Grace. I think a lot of people are going to be interested in the genesis of Will and Grace and its contribution to society. Well, yeah, you have to really give War, Warren Littlefield credit for that. 
because originally uh, it was about Will and Grace. Uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was just the two of them and Warren added to the cast and um, said it should really be about this group of people. Uh, we, the two things I remember was uh, were in the pilot, you never see Jack and Karen interact ever. If you go back and watch the movie, it's really fascinating. I went to, I had to take, there was a G guy out <laughs> coming out here, right? And Warren asked me to take him to the taping of the second episode of Will and Grace. And in that episode, Jack and Karen meet for the first time. And there's about a four or five minute scene between the two of them. And it was electricity. It was, and I walked out, I went outside and I called up Warren. And I said to Warren, Warren, I think we have a hit here, not because of Will and Grace, <laughs> but there are these two characters and I've never seen anything like this. And, and that's what I think made, made the show. And then we had to, at, at that point now, no, but at that point it was controversial to put a show like that on the air. And we did make the decision not to put it on Thursday night because we were concerned that at that point, not true now, that advertisers might not want to be in it. And we felt we needed to convince them this was a great show. And, you know, once once the show works, then advertisers suddenly change their, their point of view. Yeah. Wow. We're talking about 19, 1998, 99, uh, so 20 years ago. And but but as, as Preston said, it was it was funny. I remember it being funny. I remember the first time Jack walks in with Guapo, the bird, uh, the feathers. He's got to cover the feathers are coming out. And I'm laughing. He's so it's such, such a queen. It, it was a real mm -hmm. queen scene. And and, uh, and everyone's laughing. I'm thinking, oh, should we be laughing at this? Is this a <laughs> I, oh, shit. I don't know. But, uh, you know, uh, people people accepted it. It did well. But we, we had it on Monday first. Yeah. Uh, let's not jump in. Let's yeah. let's just kind of wet our toes here on right. Monday night. And, and you know, we uh, I had several conversations with the creators of it who were really angry with us for for not putting it on Thursday night. And I just would calmly say to them, guys, we're, we're, we think we're doing what's in the best interest of the show. We want the show to work. And we want the show to be on our schedule for a long time. And if we go out there and try and make a bold statement and the advertising community says thanks, but no thanks, um, we're, you're going to be canceled. You know, so why don't we start on Monday? I think so, at some point we move them to Tuesday and then eventually Thursday. So they, they got there. You know, it's interesting because it, 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 you kind of run parallel lines to policymakers and content creators in terms of like, moving us forward in terms of normalizing all sorts of different people that may may be in your family and or that you may encounter or that you may work alongside and so do you feel like content creators pull policy are you guys ahead pulling policy behind you <laughs> i think we just i, I i'm not going to speak for vince but i think i am i think we just put on the best shows and the funniest shows and for us it's not so much uh, oh, there happened to be two gay men in the show. They were funny people. And um, it, it, I think it's a, it's a, a positive um, effect of that. But I honestly can tell you that I don't think we st stood we sat around and said, you know, we're going to change the world or we're going to force people to watch something. We're going to we're going to offer them a funny show where there happened to be. Um, um, two gay men and um, if they like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. But it shouldn't be because of them, you know. Uh, I mean, look, I remember when we, um, there are times where there's a confluence of what's going on in the world and um, the shows, I remember when we saw the Freaks and Geeks pilot, which was a phenomenal pilot and that was around Columbine and we had a real a lot of conversations inside the building about whether we should put this show on because, because of the connection we wound up putting it on, but um, you know, I don't think it launched a lot of careers though. It did. 
Judd it Apatow did. included. And, yeah. <laughs> and also, to this day, have, Judd Apatow. And, and a lot of them became not so nice after we launched their uh, careers. <laughs> well, Judd, Judd Apatow hate, hated my guts because uh, because the, he never liked the way we, we scheduled or marketed the show. And then I went over to Fox and he had a show at Fox called Undeclared, and that also failed. So he blamed me for his failure in television. And I remember one time I responded to him in something, and I said, but, but you should be thanking me for your successful movie career. Yeah. Well, exactly. that's a good we way of looking did, at it. We, we also, sometimes the scheduling conflicted with the marketing. I'll give you the main example of moving Friday Night Lights to Tuesday. <laughs> So, uh, so that was the marketing that, guy. That was after me. Say, that's Friday Night Lights. Now on, I don't know, Tuesday. So, that's a great example, though, Vince. Friday Night Lights was a conundrum, and so was the the cop show Southland, which I loved. Sometimes you can't guess why they don't work, and then somebody I, I, else I, takes them, and they right. turn out to be successful. That you're right. It, 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 it it's sometimes. I think we, yeah, we, we've been confused quite a few times. Again, going back to Musty TV, we had a lot of uh, suddenly Susans and <laughs> Boston Common and Boston Upwards and Union Square and shows I, I, I literally worked on. I worked on, I put my blood, sweat and tears on. I can't remember them. The, the key, <laughs> I think what was touched on here, and, and if I had any, any wisdom it was casting. It was the character. Oh, yeah. It was Niles on Frasier, you know, being able to recognize those things. You know, Frasier was on Cheers. Great. But, you know, you add Niles, a dad, the little dog. And, you know, we had shows that the casting was so similar that like six months in, I'm the head of marketing. We're in a, a current meeting and they're talking about the show and I have to raise my hand and say, Four kings, is he king number three or is he king number two? Which one is he? You'd never ask that of Kramer. You never asked that of, of, of any of the friends. You, you knew they were all distinctive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking of uh, casting, uh, tell the story about Jennifer Aniston almost not being cast on Friends. Oh, um, yeah. She, uh, when, um, when we put together the cast of friends uh jennifer aniston was in a six i think it was a six episode order comedy on cbs i think it was called down south i can't remember anymore it was so it wasn't that good and it didn't make the fall the, the uh the schedule but they kept it and they didn't cancel it they didn't dump it and um they decided to put it on in the um summer uh, and they had um, they had her in what was called first position, where if they picked up the series, she could not do Friends. She had to stay on that show. So we were at a current meeting, which is when we would talk about the shows and everything. And it came up that CBS was putting the show on. And Warren Littlefield, who was my boss, turned to me and he just said, kill it. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, and Warren's the nicest, sweetest yeah. guys. This is, but he's like, there's like this, you kill, you, you have to kill the show. Did you use so, a knife? No. <laughs> well, worse than a knife. I, I, we, had, we had original Danielle Steele movies that were in the can. Original, first run, never been on. And um, I ran two of them on the first two weeks in the summer knowing full well that you know we were gonna, we were going to take a hit with them because we couldn't charge what we normally would but we ran two mm. weeks of original danielle Steele movies um in order to just prevent the audience from getting over there and i think then i ran four repeats but um so i killed it wow. <laughs> you know and I mean, look, I've been, I've been on the other end of it. I've been, I remember when, uh, I think, I can't remember if Vince was still at NBC when I was at Fox. Um, Jeff Sucker, great individual, uh, decided to um, kill the OC, which we put on in the summer. And he ran an episode of Fear Factor against the premiere, which came on in August. I heard it, but he figured his job was done. And the next week, there was no Fear Factor there. 
and the rating went up. Wow. Okay. So then the next week he put a repeat fear factor against it and the rating stayed about the same. And then he, he didn't, and the rating went up again and we had a hit show. So, you know, it's, it's one of the games that we all, we all played in scheduling where we would, um, I remember we, we had a made for TV movie with Tiffany and Amber Thiessen, uh, on, which we were putting on a Monday night and Fox uh, ran an episode of Beverly Hills 90210 against it, which starred Tiffany Amber Thiessen. And mm-hmm. our head of movies and miniseries, Lynn Yukovin, called me up and she said, we, you got you got to convince them not to do this. I have an have an upset star. And I said, I can't call up another network and tell them how to schedule their network. I think that's against the law. <laughs> so she said, you have to do it. So I called up uh, the scheduling, the head of scheduling at Fox. And I didn't tell them what to do. I said, I just want you to know that you are in your hands. And he just laughed at me. And I said to him, well, I just want you to know that I one day I will have to do something about this. And um, I did. I, uh, they, they were putting on an original series about a firehouse in the summer. And we had an episode of Backdraft, uh, not an episode of the movie Backdraft. And I ran it against the premiere and killed it. You literally yeah. fought fire with fire. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's good. I didn't even think about that. And as soon as the ratings came in, I got a call from the head of Fox, the, the scheduling guy at Fox, and he said, um, "Are you done?" So he remembered. He remembered. <laughs> and I said, "One day, you know, this might be Italian in me, right, Vince? You know, one day I will have to do something to retaliate." And I did. I want to hear about the horror stories. Uh, Fritz and I both want to hear about the horror stories. Who's difficult to work with? Because you, in in order to do your job, you have to deal with with talent, and they're used to being catered to. So how do you how do you manage that? From from a marketing standpoint, uh, the 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 two worst, and when I say worst, uh, it was Seinfeld and Larry David was the exec there, the, the the exec producer. I, every week, no matter what I put in the promo, they would call. It's it, it's Jerry's on the phone. Oh, boy. You, blew, you ruined the entire episode. You blew that joke. I, I said, it, it's Kramer coming through the door. <laughs> uh, he, comes through the, he comes through the door every week. So, <laughs> so, I, I, but I, I, you know, I, I, I just got, I, you know, I stood up and I said, hey, take that shot out. <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld, thank you. And then uh, Max and David, if they if they sensed any kind grace. of uh, anti-gay whatever that you know in our in our voiceover copy or anything, a couple times I had to hold the phone over here because they were just yelling at me that way. Uh, it, it all depended on how 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 important the show was as to what i did so, so you're, you're talking about how they would react to how you had cut your promos and the promos that's ran correct. that's correct that's correct yeah they they, they seinfeld hated promotion he, he hated promotion marketing it was crass it was crude we're a pure show okay all right <laughs> oh, okay yeah we'll give it to somebody else who appreciates it i'll tell you <laughs> i i have a local news uh interpretation of that too if our newscast at 11 o'clock ever had a freeway chase or something who do you think's on the phone at 11 36 leno yelling at the news <laughs> oh, director yeah. what are you doing you're killing my show you're ki-. and it's the monologue is the first 10 minutes you know so he used to go crazy if we did any, even if it was like a seven point earthquake and people's lives were in danger you know, you're eating up my show. And he'd call and yell at the person on the desk. Uh, yeah, I, I dealt more with, I didn't deal with talent as much as I dealt with the executive producers mm-hmm. um, who would, um, I had a, I, I, I honestly, I can't, re- I don't think there was any executive producer that I, I dreaded calling me Dick Wolf a little bit, <laughs> you know, he sounds scary. Yeah, he would, he would complain a little bit, but other than Dick Wolf, most of them were, you know, you, you, you learned how to hold their hands and explain. Uh, I re- one of my favorite stories was with Mitch Hurwitz and who uh, created uh, Arrested Development. Rupert Murdoch did not like Arrested Development, did not like it. And um, the second year it was on, 
I called up Mitch and I said, Would you need to deliver all the episodes of Arrested by March. I need to get them on the air and done before we go into our scheduling meetings. And he said, oh, why? I said, because if that shows on the air, when we go into our scheduling meetings, Rupert Murdoch is going to cancel it. Uh, he's going to demand that we cancel the show. And I said, if it's go- gone, you know, we'll humor him. We'll, you know, we'll, he'll, he'll have forgotten about it. And then we can put it back on the air. Uh, because we loved it. It was just kind of like it was never successful as Seinfeld, but it was again one of but those. It, but it developed a huge cult following. Yeah, after it was one of those broadcast. shows where, you know, we wanted to keep it on. And he said, okay. <laughs> you know, and he, he, he delivered all the episodes and we, we, we were done with it and we brought it back for a third season. So, um, so I, you know, I found that uh, the exec producers would generally call and complain, but if you explain to them why we were doing what we were doing, they were, and we're honest with them. They, they were okay. Well, let's talk about the launch of Discovery Plus and how much of your chest of tools is being implemented and how much are you having to, to learn freshly for this task? I guess I'll start since I got the uh, the call last July from uh, another uh, person who worked with us uh, at NBC, David Zasloff, who runs all of Discovery. And uh, he asked if I could put together a small team to help him launch this thing. Uh, they, they are very, very talented people internally at, at uh, Discovery Plus, which I counted on. But they're all individual there. It's individual channels. And here we are trying to incorporate all of that into one entity. So that I say that because that's what we always did. That's what uh, uh, Preston and I were good at, creating events, creating uh, something that uh, made you say, hey, uh, I'd like to, uh, bottom line is you gotta, whatever you're doing, people have to say, yeah, that looks good. I'll pay five bucks for that. Yeah, that's good. So I think he knew that. And uh, I think we also came on board without an agenda, without any, you know, there was there was no rivalry. It was just two old guys coming on, although we prefer the term pre-owned. <laughs> <laughs> Gently so, used. So, what was the uh, what was yeah, the concept? So, did they give you a mandate, say we want you, we want you to build a channel that does this, or did you come up with the idea yourself? Oh, no, no, no. It was, they were, they, they already knew, they knew the name. Uh, they knew what they were going to do. I think it evolved while we were there. I think if anything, we probably pushed them hard on the importance of original programming uh, on the channel. Uh, I think we pushed them hard on that. Most people don't know all the channels that make up discovery. Uh, so there were a couple of things we, from research, from focus groups, and just from being in the business forever that I think we just really emphasized, but they, they, you know, they knew they were doing it. They had an original launch date. Fortunately, I think for a lot of reasons, they pushed it back a bit. Um, but they, you know, they, they were, they, it wasn't like we, we walked in there and it was like, okay, the, everything's lying around on the table, put it together. I think it was more like, okay, how do we bring this across the finish line and what are we trying to communicate? The, uh, the tagline stream, what you love was seemed, seemed like a natural because people are very passionate about these shows on the, on the networks. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, if you know anyone who watches these shows, they're just, they're appointment television for a certain group of people. So uh, our job was to, again, the good news is uh, the discovery is a known name. The bad news is it's known it's as discovery. A, a nature channel. So we had to convince people uh, that it was way more than that, including uh, TLC and Dr. Pimple Popper and uh, and uh, the BBC. The Magnolia Network and right. all those kinds so, of things. So we went about doing that, um, you know, in whatever clever ways we could, while also emphasizing the, the fact that it was different than any of the other streamers because it's only reality programming. Oh, By the wow. way- they hate 
they hate the word reality. I don't, we, we couldn't figure any of that out uh, where, you know, it's like a, well, so you're the only reality show. Oh, we don't say reality. Okay. You know, I think, I think hey, all right, well, 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 how do you, what do you want to say? I think it was re- we went wound up with real life or something. Real life, yeah. We wound up. Uh, with real life. Yeah. For some reason, reality programming was. So rattle no, off some uh, of the top. Yeah. Rattle off some of the top shows for us. Uh, each well, there's ninety days is huge. Nine um, day fiance is huge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's also a train wreck, but it's great television. I mean, <laughs> uh, the one the one negative of doing this is uh, my wife and I are now addicted to it. Oh. And as much as we would like not to be addicted to it, once yeah. you start watching it, it's just it's just a train wreck. And yeah, I think the Bachelor it. is a gateway drug to ninety days. <laughs> yeah. And they built and they they built and what they're they're doing quite successfully is they're building a whole world around ninety day. You know, there's there's so so a lot of it's original to Discovery Plus, a lot of it's still on TLC. So they're creating a whole universe of ninety day story and a bunch of characters like that that guy you have seen <laughs> you know so they uh it's really it's really then they have the whole makeover shows and have the two brothers uh and um you know Probably diners drivers and dives so a lot That's of right. diy stuff a lot of uh cooking a yeah. lot, a lot of cooking, of... uh they have both the cooking and the food channel so mm-hmm. uh you know you got you covered there uh, I am still trying to make it through one episode of Dr. Pimple Popper. <laughs> I don't, I, I no, look I at can't. the title I, I, of that. I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, it's like a true test of. No, it's a traumatizing to watch that show. Yeah. I, I'm not sure uh, uh, who's watching that, but apparently they that. Are, oh no, are, it's really, they, it's really. The hard. title must, uh, as it, as it kind of repels me, it must attract others. I'm it guessing. It's, I think it's a, it's challenge. Okay. Can I, can I it's, get through this thing? I have a softball on my forehead. <laughs> what are you taking out of there? What is that? You know, it's like, like Fear Factor, right? You're going to watch a guy eat bugs. Fear Factor. Thank you. Can you do it? <laughs> what about some of the movie? original programming, guys? Are, are there any that you're excited about? Oh well, we didn't talk about uh, we didn't talk about the true crime. Oh, the true crime. crime yes. Yeah, actually, actually uh, one of the major drivers. Of, um, of of discovery is discovery ID, and uh, there's more and more true crime that's um, now going becoming original to the network, uh, to the to, I'm sorry to the streaming service. So um, you know they do a lot of documentaries. Also, do Nature more. Docs, they have yeah. a lot of lot and of uh, documentaries. Uh, I think if the, the 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 challenge is going to be, how do they discover? their Mandalorian, their, mm. uh, you know, Star Trek. How do they get that big event that will drive people to Discovery Plus? The other uh, the other services, you know, they can put in a big movie, a big uh, series or whatever. It, it's, it's a little different with uh, Discovery Plus, but uh, I think they'll find their way. They, they will do that. I, I, I had, you know, there are a couple of recommendations. Uh, I, I know Preston and I, I talked about seeing if they could get, um, uh, was it World Vision? Oh, uh, Eurovision. Eurovision. Sorry. Yeah. You know, a big event like that. That's not exactly reality, but why not? You know, it's it's not scripted. That that would be an event like that that you can, you know, because again, part of what they would like to do is, I think. They're doing just fine here in the States. They want to really broaden it out. Uh, they have such a great footprint uh, universal, uh, worldwide that they want to make sure that, you know, it's all covered. I think you want some kind of appointment because what, you know, what has made you guys successful is the concept of appointment television. So it, like American Idol, for example, if you don't watch it live tomorrow, people are going to be talking about who was eliminated. So there's certain things that you just have to watch while they're happening well, it's a streaming service, so um, a I think it's a little, it's a little it's different. It's trickier, but you could still create an event where well, as soon as it lands, people are going to want to watch Well, it. I think what's happening, what you say, you say I'm, I'm a big believer that everything comes back to what broadcast television was eventually. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're starting to see Disney especially uh, is getting back into the once a week. Uh, I drop an episode a week as mm-hmm. opposed to dropping all 12 episodes at the same time. And HBO um, is doing that as well. Yeah. So you still, well, HBO's always done that, but you're okay. starting to uh, to see that the streamers 
are acting a bit more like the broadcasters. HBO uh, and Netflix, I think in France, is starting to uh, create more linear channels on their service where, you know, you, you can you know, just turn it on and watch. I think one of the great things about Discovery Plus that makes it distinctive is you can literally just say, I just want to watch Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives, hit a click, and it can be your companion all day. Mm-hmm. Or if you like pimples, <laughs> you know, <laughs> pop, you can just watch it all day. So um, I think in some ways it's a distinctive service. Uh, but but Finch is right. You know, at some point you want something that's good. And again, it's only been around for three months. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I think that is true, by the way, yeah. January 4th. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you, I think a year from now, if we had this conversation, I think Discovery Plus is going to look a lot different than it looks now. And hopefully they will have found their, um, their Mandalorian. Do you think that streaming is going to put a permanent hurt on network primetime programming? I mean, not just because there are no commercials for the most part, but also the content is edgier and smarter and some would say better. Well, I, I mean, I think that some, first of all, a lot of what's successful on streaming services are network shows mm-hmm. like The Office, like Friends, yeah. uh, and some of the most successful shows on the um, streaming services are very network-like. Like, for instance, on Netflix, there's a show called Virgin River, mm-hmm. which um, it's Providence. <laughs> I yeah. mean, it's a show that Vince and I know very well. And, yeah. I, and it's, I, think what, I think there's a disconnect between what is critically praised and what people like to see. So uh, it's, it's always cool to talk about, you know, the, the more esoteric shows. But I think for most people, uh, they just want a good story. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I think that you see that a lot of what's successful on streaming services is what is successful on broadcasting. Uh, what, what streamers give you and what the DVR did is they just give you more control over you know, when you watch these things. Right. But, yeah, and they're giving you but, the perception that you're getting infinitely more, mm-hmm. even though, as you say, yeah. the most successful ones are the network shows. And you know what? Last I looked, is still only 24 hours to the day. <laughs> That's true. So, yeah. You know. I mean, you have more options, Fritz. You have, you don't have to necessarily watch what's on TV. And if you get interested in a show, I mean, one of the factors for me used to be like, oh, I, I can't start the West Wing now. I've already missed three seasons. I wouldn't know what's going on. And now you can go back to the beginning of anything that interests you and start at the beginning. And mm-hmm. so those options are definitely beneficial. And just being able to, you know, for you guys to launch with this great catalog of of shows and seasons yeah. of shows is what's going to get people in. And how's how's it been going for you in these past three months? Oh, uh, they're doing really well. They're, they're doing really well. I think they started with uh, within a, a couple of months, 11 million, whatever the subs were. Um, uh, it, it was uh, way beyond what they had anticipated. Uh, quite honestly, I don't know what the recent number is, but they everybody seemed really happy uh, there. And, uh, and You ought to thumb so, through what uh, they have to uh, offer at well, discoveryplus.com. You know, what, what is the next phase is going to be the most... The, the most crucial what is the next next phase of of either marketing or programming that they uh, they do how do they expand it out uh, I think they've got a lot of uh, decisions to make because uh, again you can go through everything rather quickly and uh, you're gonna need some original material in there yeah so just... and they are doing it but it's not bit it's always they do a new series primarily, and it's smart in the beginning to that are that are based on other series. So again, like Preston said, ninety day single guy, uh, you know, uh, the the Magnolia Network uh, with uh, with Chip and Joe, and uh, you know, so you know them, but it's not quite the same, but a little different. But you know, they have elements that uh, that you know. Spinoffs. Spin-offs yeah. well, check out what they have at discoveryplus.com. They're offering a free seven-day trial, more content than you can ever possibly stream. It's not reality television. I want you to know that right up front. It suggests 
real situations is what they're trying to say. Is that what they said? No, I, I just made that up. Oh. <laughs> Fritz is going to be your spokesmodel. He's yeah. got that's it. Our, it's a long for a marketing uh, <laughs> slogan. I just wanted you to know. That's all. Just long. I know. Well, That's is there anything out, out before we wrap things up, guys? Is there anything else we should know about it, or people should know where they can get it, where they can watch? If you're a Verizon subscriber, um, it comes along. You can get it for free for a year. Uh, it's it's one of the 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 more reasonably priced streaming services, and I do believe that there's going to be a shakeout in in this world of streaming. I mean, there's so many of them oh my God, right now, and I, I believe that. Um, what, what I found exciting about working on this project was I think that they really are an alternative to all the other, the Paramount Pluses, the, the Peacocks, all those, that they, they have a very, they're going to be in it for the long haul. Mm -hmm. I, do you guys find it interesting that uh, Mad About You found this afterlife on Spectrum TV? They did a couple of seasons over there. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, you know, uh, you know, content now. Fantastic. Everybody wants content. Everybody want needs content. The, the 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 better, the more there are, the more content they right. need. Right. Yeah, it, it's an ever growing beast, as they say. Uh, it, it just uh, it, it was a, just to end with. It was a nice project for the two of us. Yeah. Just to see to work together again and to uh, to know that you can still do it. You know, uh, yeah. still do it a couple more times. Absolutely. Hey, I, I want to thank Vince Manzi and Preston Beckman. I want to thank Vince for my career. The way, <laughs> the way I look at it, he helped put my daughter through college, and God bless you, my friend. All right, here come your credits. We would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where we are Media Path Podcast. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. We would love to know what media you've been enjoying. You can contact us at our social media or email us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. We want to thank our guests, Vince Manzi and Preston Beckman. Our team includes Dina Friedman, Francesco Demanda, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filippiak, Thomas Hubble, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palanker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the media path.